you so much. That is beautiful. I appreciate you doing that for us. Uh, I think we've all thought at one time or another that we have thought that if only God would answer a particular request, uh, that I'll be okay. It's something maybe we've been praying for for a long time, and if only He would grant it to us, it'd be all right. Fix one thing. It could be as if I could just lose 20 pounds. Uh, If I could just get into shape and then it's okay. If I could just get this, this new job, God, if you could provide this new job for me, oh, I'm going to be okay. Well, the Bible tells us differently. So does our guest today. Our guest today reminds us of where fulfillment in life really is. It's found in God alone. But I first want you to think of what's that one thing that maybe you've prayed for a lot? It may have been an event that took place. Somehow God redefined that because it weighs heavy. I wish it could go away. Maybe it's a, um, a loss. If I could just, God, somehow if I can have that back. And God, by the fact that you can't bring it back or don't, I'm stuck. It's plan B at best. It it just isn't. I'm destined to this place of mediocrity because of that thing that you did that I wish that I wish that it hadn't happened. So there's two characters in the Bible that had what I call a trio of prayer. They've prayed three times. It says in the text specifically, prayed three times for something to change. And in both cases, God gave a very clear, emphatic no. (laughs) One of them was Jesus. Three times in the garden, I want this to go away. And the answer was no. The other was Paul. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians 12. A thorn was given me in the flesh, called it a messenger of Satan. How's that for that thing you would change? It's a messenger of Satan. To keep me from becoming conceited, though, three times, he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul says, therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of Christ, then I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I'm weak, I'm strong. So three times, God, make this go away. No. Why? Why? because I'm enough. Look to me, I'm enough. Sufficiency in Him alone. So I don't know what your trio of prayer might be. I think we probably all have one. Am I right? Something that the truth is, we think, if it could change, I'm going to be better. I'll be in a better state of mind. I'll be more fulfilled if that changes whether you've even prayed it. And we do that all along the same time that we're saying, God, you're my sufficiency. You're all I need. Yeah, plus this. This. So it brings us to our guest today. 26 years old. I'm a little disappointed that I had the age wrong for the last two weeks. It's our oldest son, Grant, 26 years old, began losing, learning the hard way like many of you, that life hurts and that within significant loss, contentment needs to be rediscovered. Grant here is married to Michelle now for four years. He has two master's degrees, uh, one from ASU and one of the rival University of Arizona. Traitor. 
currently works at a very large school district in Phoenix with sight-impaired students. He began losing his vision uh, in about first grade, was legally blind by the time he was in junior high. So if you would welcome our guest, Grant. Welcome to Southwestern PA. Oh, yeah, thanks. It's you a little like, wet here. <laughs> you notice that? Just a little. Yeah, Pirates game was nice right up until the rain. Just a little bit there, but yeah. it's still fun. But we got accessible accessibility mm-hmm. seats because we took him. <laughs> the important part. Yeah, it would have been just four of us going, but I'm like, oh, no, if we bring Grant, we could have cool seats. So we brought him. Um, so, okay, let's get into right away. What's the eye condition? Tell us, tell us what's going on. When did you realize it? What is it? Yeah, actually, first, I just want to say thank you for inviting me to be here. And I'm grateful to be with all of you. It's been a while now since parents have been here, and grateful that now we can come be with all of you. Uh, to answer your question, uh, I started losing sight yep, when I was seven years old. I uh, didn't really understand what it was or why it was happening. It was a very sudden shift. Uh, been playing baseball with friends, and all of a sudden, one day in the backyard playing catch with you. We were throwing some balls up in the air and I started losing them in the clouds because of the white ball and the white clouds. They just looked the same and realized so quickly that it would fall and hit me in the face. I just didn't know what to do about it. And so there was my dad encouraging me to just take off my script and play like a man. You remember that? We didn't know there was a problem at the time. Uh-huh. I, okay, let's be honest. I, I said that a few times. I'd throw the ball to him. I mean, he was fine, like, literally the week before. He's fielding, and I'm throwing, and he's getting hit in the chest. And what is a guy, right? I'm like, guys, am I right? You say, son, take off the skirt, play like a man. And he keeps getting hit, and then finally, yeah, sorry about that. In hindsight, hey, sorry about that. Yeah, in 2020, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, that's ironic. Yeah, huh? Um, no, it took a while, because even then, we still just thought it was an accident. Like, okay, whatever, just don't like baseball as much anymore, maybe. I'm just not paying attention. But all of a sudden, started walking into walls, uh, dropping things that I thought were there. And one day at school, failed the nurse eye test. And that was a shock. Like, Do you guys remember those? How many of you kids, because the kids are still in here today, you had that little eye test thing at school the that I thought was top. silly? Like, what are they going to really discover? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Apparently it does work. <laughs> Apparently it does. But you're walking into doors and stuff. So that was the other thing. Yeah, we said, okay, there really must be something. And th- once we told them that, they said, okay, that does make sense. There's probably an issue. Let's refer you to an ophthalmologist. Uh, and so as we were there doing additional testing, they noticed um, issues with my peripheral on the outside, along with some clarity on the inside. Um, so loss of outside meaning look like a tunnel or if looking through a paper towel roll. And then, for me, additionally, more blurred in the center. And they said that's stereotypical for individuals with visual impairment for retinitis pigmentosa, or RP. So, like, kids that are in here, how many of you kids wear glasses? Like, if you're a teen, yeah, you've got glasses on. Any other, like, little? Yeah, they have some with glasses. So we thought that might fix it. And then the lenses uh, ended up not fixing things at all. So it was only for clarity. That's all the glasses will actually help with is fix the clarity of the vision. Nothing about the peripheral or night vision, all of that can't be fixed with glasses. You had to go through childhood and any junior hires in the room. That's when he officially was legally blind and then, you know, just kept going. So childhood, junior high, high school, um, cha- especially challenging. I mean, if there's some some things that were especially difficult during that time? Yeah, especially uh, things like cafeteria. People all get excited to go to recess, and instead I regretted it. I didn't want to go because it was an unfamiliar area that I'd have to walk around, figure out lines, not go in the wrong place, find a seat at the table. All that would just be so confusing and a blur to me. I didn't like it. I wanted to just sit in the corner then, bring my lunch to school. But And then, like, sitting in cafeteria, everyone's, like, at this point, a blur. It's all yeah. dark. Mm-hmm. You don't know where to go sit. Nope. Like, that's awkward anyway. Remember how we all walk into the cafeteria and you don't know where to go? Well, not knowing. And I think the challenge, too, you didn't at the time carry a cane. True. Mm-hmm. And then obviously your buddy down here wasn't there. So most of the school didn't even know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it wasn't fun to admit every time you say to someone, hi, my name's Grant and I have a visual impairment. I'm blind. Not really a fun welcome to the new school, new yeah, class. Yeah, that's a- mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a little awkward, yeah. right? So we, uh, we went to D.C., and we're still figuring all this out because uh, it kept changing. Mm-hmm. So right, when you got it figured out, some of you have done that. Like with macular degeneration, mm-hmm. you get it figured, but then it drops again, and so you have to refigure. So we're go- doing the capital steps, mm-hmm. all the, uh, the marble steps. All one color of white, just blended all together. It looked like a giant slope to me, but they're all different sizes because of the different landings. And so trying to figure out, okay, start walk, nope, this is different. And so I'd kind of stub my foot or then out of nowhere, I'd be watching, okay, I'll follow my dad then. But no, he would get to the bottom and keep going, even though there were no stairs. You know no how you stairs. do that? Well, you act like you're still walking on steps? Mm-hmm. So he's holding my, is that hilarious? Come on, you have to admit that's funny. So I'd get to the landing and I would go another step down. Okay. And then he would hit, and it's no step. He's like, what in the world? And I'm like, I'm just seeing if you were paying attention. Mm-hmm. So then, of course, I then turn once I, he kept doing that over and over again because he just thought it was funny and funny and funny. Every time. And it was like, okay, now I know to expect it, but he's not expecting me. So as we got closer to the sidewalk, I got close, and he's like, okay, just wait here for a second. I said, what? And I kept walking closer to the curb and kind of tripping, acting like I'm going into traffic. And he's like, whoa, I told you to stop. He's like, oh, I heard you. I was just going to see if you were paying attention too. That gave me a heart attack. <laughs> in a busy intersection in D.C., he trips and is he going into traffic? And he goes, just kidding. Like, who's the jerk now, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like father, like son. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so the funny one was um, he would, uh, well, even this morning was that way. I'm sitting with coffee in the one room. If he walks into a room, if you don't say anything, you know, he doesn't know you're there. So the polite thing is, hey, Grant, just to acknowledge. Um, so he would come down the stairs, and as he's walking down the stairs, I hear him coming, and I would just stand around the corner and stand and wait and then scare him. Oh, serious? Really? Do you remember we told that to that, um, that uh, school of kids in Camp Verde? They about chased me out of the building when I said that because they all had disabilities, uh-huh. and I told that, and they're like, get him! Uh-huh. It was <laughs> I mean, even I knew it was just a joke. I mean, I didn't like it, but... Well, because you ended up winning. This is true, because then I could hear when he would kind of start giggling to himself <laughs> around the corner that I'd walk around and punch him in the stomach then. So. That scared me. I did not see that coming, <laughs> so I stopped doing that. Mm-hmm. You've, um, so challenges throughout, like uh, maybe a sore spot, badminton. Do you mm-hmm. Yeah, the different sports in school, because every couple months they rotate. So just as soon as I'd even figure out, maybe I could do one part of the sport. Like basketball, I could at least shoot it. I don't have to do everything. But then it's new month, new sport. And badminton, there's not much you can do, because it's just this small thing, and it doesn't make noise. And so, but I still had to get a grade in the class, and so they would say, just try. And I was like, okay, whatever. And it would just fly over, and it would go past me or hit me, and it's like, well, it doesn't hurt. It's just annoying. So the coach actually had the entire class mm-hmm. say, Grant, you're just not trying. Everybody wait. Grant's going to do this. And they're throwing the birdie at it, and he's swinging. Mm-hmm. And this one cute little gal mm-hmm. tried to go to the coach. Mm-hmm. And she said, Coach, Coach, he can't see. So they stop it. He's fine. And he's swinging. So junior high gym class. Okay, am I right? That's not bad enough mm-hmm. to have that going on. Um, that's, 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 pretty, uh, that's pretty challenging. You've been able to travel. Are there some highlights just for fun <laughs> that you think of still that you were able to see? Yeah, around junior high, high school, we you know, said, let's try to see the world before I can't, if there's anywhere I really wanted to go. Um, one that I'd read about in school was the Grand Canyon because of Arizona. Um, everyone likes to look at the big hole, but I learned about all the stuff at the bottom and the water, and so it would be fun to kind of see that, hear it. And we were able to white water raft that for a week. That was incredible. Um, then we had a chance to go to Italy, a uh, chance to go to the Sistine Chapel, and they actually 3D printed the models of the paintings for me to feel as they explained oh, them to me. Yeah. That was incredible. And that was before 3D printing was popular. I mean, that was really unexpected and the cool. The ceiling, if you've been to Sistine Chapel, you know the famous ceiling? Mm-hmm. God's finger. So now. it's this tactile, mm-hmm. uh, and you could he feel and she, the gal explained all the artwork mm-hmm. and you can feel it and she, in fact don't the fingers not touch correct mm-hmm. and yeah. she goes nobody knows that because they're looking at it and but it feel it like you a, can see they're actually not touching yeah that they give us a personal tour one-on-one and we're explaining everything it was extremely nice of them to do that 
Um, I guess another one would be going inside the pyramids of Giza, feeling the hieroglyphics. That was incredible. Um, yeah, those are some of the big ones that come to mind. Yeah, those are some great ones. Um, so what are the challenges now? That was past. It's kind of subsided a little bit now. You still, we said that with Alinda this morning. We're commenting that he still, it acts like there's not an issue because he does good eye contact. Like, if you, were to, if you wanted to see me, theoretically, mm-hmm. like, just yeah. uh-huh. make that up, uh-huh. how would you look to see me? I'd look about here. So while I lost all of this over here, this is blurred. There's like a clearish ring in the middle where there's still enough vision where you're a little more clear. And no I, detail, correct, right? Still you can no just detail, see that I'm here. But there's more clarity, and I can see more movement there because that's actually where more of the rods and cones are located. It's kind of in that middle, not far edge, not center, the middle ring-ish, and that's why it allows me to see movement there. So like somebody who's sight impaired, when they don't look at you, there's a reason, probably they probably have an area that they want to, but for social reasons. Still try to. Yeah, Grant's really good about it. It's not best for me, but I'm gonna try to look you straight in the eye even though I don't see you really at all that way. Um, what are the challenges now? What, what's, what's a day look like? How does it, um, it affect you day to day, day to day? Yeah, I mean, from cooking and cleaning, that's extremely difficult. Um, I still will burn myself or uh, electrode on the grill sparked just last month, got my in the finger, and it's just, that's all you can do is just try, keep, do something different, and avoid that in the future. Um, uh, let's see, traveling for work, because um, I'm an itinerant teacher, which means I travel to any school that has a student with a visual impairment. It sounds great on paper that I'm just going to work with them and help them, but there's 13 schools across 30 different miles, and I can't just get up and go to that like others can. And so transportation can be really difficult. Even if I try to use Uber, I mean, it'll take 15, 20 minutes for the ride to get there, and then another 20 minutes to drive from me to the school, so I've lost 40 minutes, and the student could be out of school by then depending on what part of day. How do you learn a different school? Because you've got mm-hmm. uh, any problems like steps in weird places or anything? Try to do a mental map. Uh, so if I go to a new school, I try to just do one route from point A to point B. And landmarks, I'll try to feel, OK, certain doors have different handles, or maybe there's a weird shaped tree that has a weird shadow. That's enough for me to kind of remember. Uh, and so I'll try to just always walk that path from the office to the school uh, and the classrooms. What's and the brick wall story? Wasn't that recent? Yeah, that was recently, yeah. It was a new school. <laughs> he goes, yeah, that was and recently. So every school we have materials at, and so I had to go collect them, and I hadn't been there in a while. And I was going around a different corner because they were having a parade for the end of school and thought, okay, I'll be fine. The office is just a little bit more ahead, and I'm carrying a bunch of stuff. And sure enough, there's a brick wall about a foot high, and it's like, oh, right into the shin. And it's like, well. Yeah. It wasn't tall enough that I wouldn't have felt or seen it. And so, Where was she? She was at home. Oh, she was at home yeah. doing what she's doing right now. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So um, the other, uh, uh, you golf. Mm-hmm. A little bit. And you did um, turn- tournaments in high school. Yeah. Um, so we were so proud. Prescott, Arizona. He's going for a tournament over there. Has a, like a caddy with him to help him uh, line up a ball and tell where to go and whatever. Um, but you ended up uh, forfeiting that tournament. Yep, first hole. <laughs> okay, so? Yeah, yeah, that didn't happen long. So, man, I've been practicing a ton. It was fine, decent swing, but first shot went out into the edge, and I'm like, okay, this is kind of a rough spot, but it's fine. I'll just kind of bury it in some grass. I'll just take a bigger chunk out, and hopefully it'll go further, and hit it as hard as I could, hit behind the ball, didn't move. And I was like, oh, that's stupid. Well, just try again. <laughs> hit again, and then I felt kind of some of the grass kind of spur up because I hit it so hard. And I was like, okay, I'll just try one more time. I hit it again. Sure enough, it was a hornet's nest. Yeah, no one told me that. So, so your caddy is up on the grass. Because uh-huh, he's a few feet away because he doesn't want to get hit by the swing or whatever. So he's just a little bit behind me. And he sees me go, ah, and he's like, I didn't notice that myself. I feel off. I'm like, what are you supposed to do? I mean, it just happens. So you got stung? About 15 times. Yeah. That, that ended the... Uh, yep, the leg was swollen and then had to sit there for the rest of the tournament. Like golf isn't bad enough on its own. You know? Yeah. <laughs> what a horrible sport anyway. Um, some of you must agree and some of you must really disagree. <laughs> I understand that. Um, well, you're flying home alone next Saturday. Yep. So That'll be difficult because of not being able to... I don't know the landmarks. I've never been in that airport, so that'll be a little different. Um, versus Arizona, I mean, I've been 
flying out of that one a lot. It's a little more familiar. Uh, this one, I'll probably end up having to FaceTime my wife or ask for more help from individuals and um, should be okay, but at the same time, never done it before, especially with the dog. Some people are, you know, ask questions more often and that's fine. I want to educate them, but at the same time, it then takes away time from me getting to point B. And so what's, what are some of the resources then? You mentioned the dog. What are some other resources mm -hmm. that help you day to day Yeah, that, well, that maybe we don't know about or maybe we do? One that I really don't know why, even in the vision community, they don't talk about it. Uh, all Apple devices, iOS, like iPhones, iPads, they all have accessibility in the settings menu. And sure enough, there's a whole vision section where you can invert the colors. Uh, I use something called VoiceOver. It's a screen reader. So every time I touch the screen, it highlights a box and reads it aloud to me. And so that helps especially with like texting. I can then highlight the letter, then double tap to confirm that's the one I wanted before hitting another letter in space. And that way I'm not messing up all the time. Aren't there swipes or something? Yeah, I can swipe three fingers up, three fingers down to go up and down, left, right. Um, <laughs> It's, I mean, there's about 80 different gestures to learn that, because if you can imagine, if you say answer a call, you normally swipe with one finger. Well, if I did that, I could accidentally hit the end call. So I have to find the answer button, then double tap with two fingers to answer it. So that way I don't accidentally end the call. Kind of nice, but at the same time, kind of annoying in the sense you have to remember all the different gestures. Yeah, it's amazing. That's on every iPhone. Yep. Yeah, that's amazing. What other, what other things do you use? Uh, I use Braille around the house still a little bit with like ingredients, uh, a little labeler. Um, only issue is that Braille takes up a lot of space, uh, and so they have a lot of contractions. But then if you are holding it upside down, you, know, you have to have an indicator to tell you is it left to right, right to left. If you're flipping it around, so kind of helpful, kind of difficult. At the same so time. all the any all the kids after the service. Mm -hmm. Um, you have a little brailler. We don't have the big one, mm -hmm. but you have a little brailler if you want your name in braille just for fun. So he'll stay up here and uh, he could put your name in braille for you. You could also um, uh, greet the dog yeah. if you want yeah. afterwards. Yeah, cause we'll Tell take, us about the dog. Yeah, because we'll take the harness off of her. Um, yeah. yeah but I've had the dog now for nine years. Um, she's been extremely helpful, especially when I went to college. Navigating unfamiliar environments is a big issue because She's not a GPS. She doesn't know where to go. She just knows how to identify issues. It's like if there's stairs or a door. So for me, I still have to know if I want to go straight, left, right. I have to give the command before she'll go. Um, and so with people coming up, they kind of will distract her and she'll kind of forget maybe what I said or she might be starting to look at a bush. So I have to kind of make sure I'm as prepared to give the instruction as prepared to also listen to her. Uh, and. Luckily, at the same time, she is still a dog, so as soon as the harness comes off, she'll wag her tail, she'll sniff for crumbs, she'll do anything a normal dog would, and that's to help bridge the boundary so that, you know, work isn't 24-7. She'd get exhausted of that. So. so she's really good, but we'll watch her take him somewhere, and if she sees a puddle, she'll go around the puddle so she doesn't get her feet wet and takes him through the puddle. <laughs> it's... It is the funniest thing in the world to watch. And you can see her little mind. She's looking ahead and she's like, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> he has shoes on. I don't. What are, like that friend of yours, that was a funny um, story. Uh, is it? Tor yeah, Tori. Yeah, other guide dogs, I mean, as I said, they're all dogs still, no matter how good and well behaved they are. Um, Tori was another guide dog from the same company, and we got to be friends with the owner. And she had mentioned that unlike my relationship with the dog, she actually had a bumpy start where the dog didn't like her. I was like, I didn't think that was possible. Like, how does a dog not like you when you provide everything to it? Uh, and she said that it would get upset with them while working together and would start walking her into tree branches. Like, oh, yeah, <laughs> nope, Nebraska's never done that. Puddle, not that bad compared to a tree. That is amazing. Uh, round corners, too sharp. Yep, to push them into the wall. Push them into the wall. Um, what, was that, uh, what was that funny uh, stuffed animal one? Yeah, that was cute. Uh, one of the trainers who worked with us was telling us about how to always be aware of the leash and kind of how it's moving to feel her head and kind of if anything's different. And how one client wasn't doing that while they're in a the store one day. And they got to the register, were paying, and the cash register asked, you know, hey, how much do you want, you're going to pay for the rabbit? And she's like, what rabbit? I don't have any. I grab groceries. I'm like, no, your dog has a rabbit in its mouth and it's been dragging around the whole store. Everyone noticed. She's like, Oh, that's why we were walking a little slower. I was like, well, <laughs> I guess I have to pay for it. I mean, I can't tell the dog no, and I don't know. Then what was the Apple one? That was a, I don't remember that yeah, one. That was also similar to the uh, rabbit, where they weren't paying attention to the leash, and so someone was walking and would kind of feel every now and then the head would kind of bounce up a little, 
And so they'd stop and would feel the mouth. Is you know, anything weird? Is the dog okay? Not hurt? Then say, okay, let's start walking again. Would feel it again. Stop. Feel the dog. Okay, nothing's wrong. Keep walking. And finally, it was with a trainer, and they said, okay, I had to really had to stop you. This is hilarious. The dog has an apple in its mouth and puts it down every time you go to feel the mouth, and then picks it up again to keep walking. And it's like. <laughs> Ah, I didn't. I guess I could check more. Oh my goodness, that is the best. Yeah. So yeah, if kids or you want to uh, meet uh, Nebraska, you can we'll after the, the service. She is. Uh, she is so funny. Uh, let me read this passage again to you, and I want your thoughts mm-hmm. on it. Three times, because of this thorn in the flesh, three times I pleaded with the Lord that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then he says, I am content with weakness and insults and hardships and persecutions, because when I'm weak, I'm strong. Mm-hmm. What's, what's, what's it say to you? I mean, how does that apply to you? Yeah, I mean, it makes me remember all the things Paul went through from being shipwrecked and put in prison, beaten, stoned, and yet still being able to say he has a thorn that's still been bothering him this whole time, and God says no to him, and so his response is, okay, I hear what you're saying, God. It's not going to be easy. He never says that in the verse, but he also says, I'll still be content, and it's, okay, and then he takes it even a step further, and I'm going to boast about it. Like, hmm. that, that's really not easy to do, hmm. and that's kind of something that I had to learn with the dog, where before with a cane, I could hide it, I could be kind of content with, okay, this is my situation, but I'm going to still hide the cane away. Like, I can still move around a little bit without it. But now with the dog, 24-7, she's with me. Everyone knows. And so now it's, I can use that as a positive thing of bridging the gap with an icebreaker with someone. And now working with students with visual impairments, I'm able to encourage them and say, you know, this, I would never have really spoken to you, no offense, before. I would have felt awkward coming up and talking to you, but now I have something that we can share in relationship and can encourage you on what you can do with your life. You don't have to follow exactly what I did, but, you know, one step in the right direction would be having a relationship with God. And at least starts them thinking, like, okay, I don't like what God's doing in my life, but at the same time, it's not all dark, as much as sometimes we think it is. There's still some light. There's still opportunities. Having a free guide dog, it's an incredible opportunity. And so just trying to look for those opportunities and taking them as they come seeing where it leads. So, so your sufficiency in Christ, what's the journey, what was the process? Does it, do you have to relearn that over and over? Mm-hmm. Was there a point in which it clicked? How is that process where you're saying, you know what, it is what it is, I can be okay in God? Where's that journey? Or does it keep going? Do you still wish every day, man, I wish I could see my beautiful wife and I wish I could drive mm-hmm. well, legally? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, still can drive a little. Yeah, just not. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, it was definitely a moment where I clicked in high school, kind of thinking through identity. What am I going to do for career? Had no idea. Um, but realizing that you know, there is a purpose. You know, God doesn't make mistakes. And kind of processing like who is God first and realizing... Okay, every perfect thing comes from him. He doesn't make mistakes. He's still in control. He's outside of time. So he knows exactly what's going to happen the rest of my life. He wouldn't want me to suffer the rest of my life. And so processing, um, one thing that kind of kept coming up was Philippians chapter 4, when um, a lot of people say, well, you can do all things in Christ. And it sounds great, and, but it was like, okay, but I can't drive. I can't read. I can't write. Like, I can't do everything. And then realizing that that's not really what Paul was saying. And the verse just before, he talks about how he had learned how it was to be content in poverty and in wealth and in hunger and with plenty of food. He realized that he could endure all things with Christ who strengthens him. And that kind of clicked with me realizing that, okay, it's not going to be easy, but there's a difference between happiness and joy. Would I rather be happy for a moment, being able to do the thing I wanted, or would I rather have joy for the rest of my life with a relationship with God? And so as that started to process through my mind as I went to college and kind of making more and more decisions, trying to listen for what God wanted for my life, it was able to help me direct my life and my focus, my perspective, 
and shift it towards, okay, it's not about me, it's about God, and now I can actually boast about it because I'm more confident. So probably every one of us have something that we would have prayed for to be removed, and, and still do, whether we pray it actually formally or in something with a family, it's broken up, it's a health thing, it, there's so many pieces. I put in the bulletin, there's an insert um, that you don't have. Um, this is the prayer kind of as a wrap-up. This was the prayer that I put in. I want you to listen to this in regards to a struggle or something that we have that we think that if God were to remove it, we'd be okay. Uh, the prayer is this. I want your thoughts on it, Grant. It says, Heavenly Father, I am frustrated with my life circumstance of, and I put a blank, I've prayed and I've prayed. Teach me contentment in your sufficiency and your power. I can do all things through you who strengthens me. Yeah, that's a great example of just remembering the, the verse, and I'm sure there's a lot of us in here, not just myself, and, who has something on the front of their mind that you could put in that blank. Probably doesn't even take you a second to think of it. Mm -hmm. But it's realizing that, you know, God has a plan, and all we really need to be sufficient is a relationship with Him. And so as we kind of continue to build in that relationship and listen to what He wants for our life, the more joy we can experience. Yeah. So what I'm going to have us do is think of that thing that's your life. His is obvious. I mean, when you, when you see him, you see him navigate, you're like, you know what the… Others of us, it's not so obvious. It's a struggle, maybe something we know of, but we think you're over it. Oh, that's done. And you're like, oh, no, it's every day of my life. I wish it were gone. God, if you just move it, if you just fix it, change it, if that wouldn't have happened… Whatever that thing is, have that in your mind. And Grant, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you, uh, we're going to close in prayer. Chuck will come up and wrap up the service. We're going to close in prayer, but I want you to pray for all of us. Okay. Uh, I know it's always still a journey for you, mm. and we do laugh a lot about it, and I'm still going to trick you. Mm. Okay. Shocker. Yeah, just so you know that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an everyday challenge, and we do think of that all the time. And for everyone in the room, there's something. And so, kind of joining in solidarity, this type of a, a prayer and perspective, if you wouldn't mind, close us and, and pray for all of us. Yeah, of course. Heavenly Father, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with everyone here today. God, I pray that you help my words uh, connect with someone and multiple people in this room, helping them realize that we can experience joy in our suffering. It's not easy, but we can experience contentment with you as we develop our endurance to face it, develop our character, we even develop hope in you, God. So I pray that you would help the individuals in this room develop a relationship with you in their daily life, and that they'd be able to change their perspective from themselves onto you, God, understanding that you are still in control and that we can be content in any and all circumstances with you who gives us strength. Pray this in your name. Amen. Amen.